you know, we don't know each other that well yet. We met with the cattle running through the... Yeah. <laughs> and you were calling the sheriff or something, right? Yeah. Um, it's funny. So I go out running uh, at those open spaces in Douglas County um, a lot, six days a week. And me and my wife were big supporters of Douglas Land Conservancy. And they do a lot of great work, you know. Douglas County, left to its own devices, would probably just build subdivisions over all of that, right? They'd sell that land to developers, or the ranchers would. And you can't really blame the ranchers. I mean, their kids don't want to be ranchers, and they're sitting on all that land. And land is super expensive in Colorado, right? So they want to cash out. And I don't hold that against them, but, you know, no one's going to want to move here if it's just nothing but track homes. Um, so DLC does a great job of trying to get in there, work with the ranchers, set up a, a conservancy with them, which is basically um, kind of boils down to just being a massive tax break. And the deal is they get the tax break so long as they never build anything on that property. They can continue to ranch on it, um, which is why you see cows everywhere in those open spaces. But yeah, it's a great organization and the open spaces are just super for getting out there hiking, you know, running. I know you shoot your videos down there at some of those too. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of cows and sometimes the cows bust out of where they're supposed to be and you just yeah. call the sheriff and they call the cowboys, which is what happened there. And they showed up and wrangle them all back up and fix their fences so you know as far as me i don't really have a youtube channel other than just or like a, I mean i have a channel obviously but not not like something i'm actively engaged with like i was telling you it's just more of an archive for like my little adventures mm -hmm. that's just how i've approached it with the assumption that someday i'm going to be too old to have those adventures and i'll be able to look back and, and watch those videos um and some get some get a lot of views and sometimes i get some engagement from people um some of the i guess the higher profile destinations you'll get questions about you know this and that related to someone wants to go hike there or or whatever and that's really cool but yeah um basically i just love the outdoors so you know, the running and stuff is mainly uh, a means to an end. Just try to stay fit enough to do the stuff I really like, which is, uh, you know, climbing the 14ers or backcountry skiing, uh, stuff like that. You know, just having a good good set of heart and lungs makes that a lot less painful, really. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it's not the most enjoyable thing getting up into thin air, you know, climbing up some crappy rock. It's beautiful, but it's hard work, right? So I just try to make it more enjoyable by staying fit. So that's the running, and it's hard to complain when you're running in areas like this, right? I mean, it's just pure eye candy almost everywhere down here, so. I was telling my wife that it because she's wanting to run all the time on the trails, and she's hurt her back a little bit, so the chiropractors told her, like, hey, just stop running for a little bit. But I, when I get out here, I'm... I just like to walk and enjoy the view. Mm -hmm. But you can do that running. But I keep telling her, I was like, I, I, no, let's just walk. Let's just enjoy it. But you, so do you mostly run though, or do you do some hiking also? Um, I run just from like, again, a, a <clears throat> fitness perspective. I don't, I mean, I know some people love to run. I don't love running. Like, yeah. oh, I just want to go run, right? It's not like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, another, it's like weightlifting, right? I don't just, yeah. oh, I got to go weightlift. It's, it keeps you healthy. It makes the things I like to do easier. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll walk. You know, I've got a, my dog is less than two years old and she's, she's a golden retriever. She needs to be worked. So the running helps keep her mellow too. You know, the days that she doesn't get run, her personality is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, she's much more mischievous. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to it. You know, I stay healthy. The dog stays healthy. You get out, you know, I, my job, I'm a engineering manager. So I used to be the smart guy out there installing networks. And then uh, I was designing networks and helping sell uh, computer networks, so to speak. Um, and now I manage smart people to go do that, right? So it's, it's a different job. It's, there's a different type of stress involved. And again, um, you know, not necessarily running, but just being outdoors for me helps helps alleviate a lot of that stress, helps me clear my mind. And I, you know, walking, hiking, whatever it might be, just having that space, being in nature, for me at least, helps me process through stuff that might be stressing me out or even just problems that I need to solve for work, right? Just you get out there and your mind can kind of chew on it while you're doing some physical activity. So there's a lot of benefits to it, um, which is why I try to keep doing it, you know, and I, I just turned 51 this spring. That complicates things too, right? Because you can't just go out there and grind yourself to dust, right? Um, especially as you get older, you got to pay more attention to recovery. My priority is just avoid getting injured at all costs because the smallest little injury now, you know, a sprained ankle takes months to heal. It's, it's unbelievable. So there's a lot to it. It's, it's obviously a big part of my life, which is why I keep rambling mm -hmm. on about it. But yeah, between that and work, uh, it, it'll fill up a day. Jerry and I were talking last night about this. 
And it's the stress from these jobs as you move up and everybody always wants to make more money and have more power and authority. And there's a lot of stress that comes from that. And we were talking about fishing and he does some fly fishing and hunting and all that. And, and he said for both the hunting and the fishing, it really helps him to get away from that work week. And yeah. because all of your focus is on, you know, you gotta be, everything set up right for hunting. You gotta be super quiet that the fly fishing you've got, I've, I've been starting to get into fly fishing a little bit, but there's so much to get that catch. And plus you're out in the middle of, the, of this gorgeous mountains yeah. right here. Yep. Is that true for you too, that that really helps you to just get rid of the stress and maybe keeps you from doing other things that, I mean, some people go to drinking and... Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You know, it, it probably beats smoking weed all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm not against really anything, um, especially during ski season. A lot of this, you, you kind of have to be flexible, or at least this is my take on it. You have to be flexible in how you approach life in, in all aspects, right? You can't, I, I see people, I work with people who are just 100% focused on their careers they will kill themselves to get that promotion or get the extra money, whatever it might be. Um, and that's an imbalance, right? Then they're ignoring their family, they're ignoring their physical health, whatever it might be. Um, and on the other hand, I know people who are just athletic chunkies, like all they do is play outside, run, run themselves into the grave, right? So I, I think, you know, really it's all about finding that balance and the things that you do to help alleviate the stress is, is part of that. And like you say, you know, it, stress stress is kind of like the water behind the dam right it builds up to a point it's coming over that dam it's going to blow that dam out and depending on how you're wired how you grew up or how you're made up when that dam breaks it'll come out of you in different ways right some people drink get into drugs start screwing around on their spouse it tends to be bad things um, i've never heard of someone get so stressed out that they like got super healthy right and it was a great change <laughs> Right. It tends to be bad. So avoiding that situation, I think, um, should really be anyone's goal. You don't have to be super runner guy or, or spend seven days a week fly fishing. But I do think finding those those outlets in life that lets you get away from the stressors in a healthy manner, you know, finding that healthy release is, is super important. That's just my view on it, you know, and I'm again, 51 and change. It took a long time to arrive at that view. I had very bad habits when I was younger. Uh, worked stupid hours for stupid people who just demanded more and more. And I was willing and a willing participant in that because it kept dangling more money in front of me. So I've been that guy too. I used to smoke, I used to smoke a pack a day. So yeah, it's, it's very easy, I think, just to become really tunnel visioned on one goal in life and then just lose that balance. And I think that's part of getting older, um, if you do it right, is just you get more mature, you gain that perspective that it's not all about chasing one particular thing. There's, there's a lot of things to experience and balance in life, and that's, you know, that's uh, what you need to do. So. Do you think that, is it the same when you're going up a 14 or hiking that versus fishing or hunting? Is it kind of the same thing that helps you just clear your mind? And, and it may be, I mean, some people want to hike and not fish, but is there a difference for you when you're trying to get that fish versus climbing there the There is, yeah. They're, they're, they satisfy different parts of my personality. Fly fishing in particular, um, it, it's more technical than just, you know, general fishing, you know, going out bass fishing, which is awesome too. But that engineering background of me, that, that mindset that got me into engineering and that technical line of work is um, satisfied by kind of the technical aspects of fly fishing, paying attention to the weights and, you know, looking at the hatch and all that. So I kind of get off on that to some extent, in addition to just being out in a beautiful area, especially back here, there's eagles flying around. I've had foxes run behind me while I'm fishing. You, it's hard to go wrong out here. But then when you're climbing a 14er, you know, what, what I get out of that is that physical challenge, that exertion, having to make decisions in a relatively risky environment. You know, some of them are literally just walk-ups. I mean, they're they're just high elevation walks through the park, um, but others aren't, right? I mean, there there is some serious risk involved in, in a lot of the mountains out here. And so having to make those decisions, trying to minimize risk, things like that, uh, and then just the being able to physically meet that challenge um, satisfies other aspects of my personality. So again, it's that balance, finding those things that make you happy in different ways, um, which is why I do all those various things. I like to hunt too. I love to ski. You know, the, the real... <laughs> The real balancing act in Colorado is finding time to do all this if you're not rich and retired, right? Um, that's the challenge. You know, hunting, I used to hunt more than in the Midwest than I ever have here. 
I just can't peel off for a week and go sit in a mountain waiting for an elk to walk by, right? There's just, I can't, I could do it. I, I guess I choose not to, right? I have a limited amount of time off, probably same as you from work. Um, so I just have to be careful of how I spend it. And at the same time, I'm married, so I can't just spend it all on me. So there's, there's that consideration too. But yeah, those pursuits, I try to do all of them as often as I can. And I always feel like I'm never doing something as much as I wish I could be. But uh, it's hard to complain. I mean, look where we live, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I noticed you have, it looks like, quite a few hikes and 14ers on your website or your YouTube channel. How many have you done, and have you had to do any mountaineering training to do any of them? I'd have to look and see how many I've done. I've done roughly a third, so what are there, 52 or 54? Um, so I think I'm maybe 18 or 19, so there's plenty that I haven't done. Kind of been, I guess, ranging out from home. So I've done most of the stuff right here in the Front Range, and then a lot of the stuff um, in the Swatch, so Buena Vista up to Leadville, that whole string of them there. I've got a few left to do. Um, which I'm hoping to burn down yet this year. And then you start getting those drives, right? Getting down to the San Juans, getting out further west. That that takes a little more effort and time, which is the the constraint there. So yeah, that's kind of been my approach. The the mountaineering, I actually signed up for a straight up mountaineering class last winter. Um, my wife got sick and then I had some work commitments come up. So I actually had to unreserve that class. It's still on my list. It's one of those things, as it is, my basement kind of looks like an REI. I mean, there's gear everywhere. Mountaineering requires a lot of specific equipment as well. And I just don't know, in Colorado, I'm unlikely to get out there because at our age, it's hard to find friends at our age that are, you know, physically capable of doing stuff like that. Or they have kids. There's a lot of risk involved there too, right? So mm -hmm. if you have kids, if I had kids, I wouldn't be doing backcountry skiing, stuff that can take you out, like, you know... Yeah. If you're out there and you're doing your best to minimize the risk, there's still the shit happens factor and you could just die, right? right. So for people with kids, I, I certainly can appreciate that, that factoring into the things that they choose to do. I think mountaineering is certainly on the riskier side of the spectrum of activities. So I'd still like to do it. I don't know at this point, do I really want to dump a bunch of money into some gear for a hobby that I'm probably rarely going to take advantage of? Um, because you don't need that equipment to do probably 99% of the 14ers in Colorado. And I really don't see myself flying out, you know, to go do Mount Rainier or, you know, out into mm -hmm. the Pakistan or something. I mean, that'd be awesome, right? I'd love to go yeah. climb Mount Everest, but that's, at this point, that's not gonna happen. So, so I don't know. I do, I have gone through and, and I take refresher courses every year or two. Uh, I've gone through avalanche rescue training and also just the avalanche uh i forget the official title of the class but it's airy one and airy two and that's really that's training that's really useful for anybody who wants to get out in the winter time they teach you a lot about you know what are the conditions that i guess cause avalanches so to speak you know different slope angles a slope can be too steep where the slow just the snow doesn't stick to it enough to build up to avalanche or they can be too too shallow of an angle where it's unlikely to slide and then there's kind of that sweet spot right so you obviously don't want to go skiing on the sweet spot slope but there's other considerations too you don't want to be hiking under them when you're getting to your destination and then there's just wads of so-called snow science about the you know in Colorado, we we deal with a lot of um, weird weather, especially later in the fall and early in the winter, right? We tend to get a big dump of snow in late October or November, and then it just kind of sits there and rots. We'll get like a warm spell typically. It, that snow just lays up in the mountains and gets cooked by the sun. So it turns into almost like this sugar or sand and becomes a real weak layer, and then the rest of the winter, snow just keeps dumping on that. So all winter long, that, that weak layer is under there, the Achilles heel of the snowpack. That's why we get all the avalanches. So compared to up in the Northwest where they get real heavy, wet snows, it's almost like concrete, sets up real nicely, less of an avalanche risk. So again, you know, going back to that technical aspect of the hobby that I kind of enjoy, there's that even behind the skiing, right? It's more than just slapping on the boards and going down the hill. Um, there's a lot of science behind it, things to be aware of. Uh, a lot of planning involved before you even go out. A lot of equipment, you know, we, we all carry beacons. So if you do get trapped in a snow slide, um, you've got a beacon that people can lo hopefully locate you and dig you out. Uh, I carry an inReach when I go out for obvious reasons. A lot of people carry sat phones. So yeah, uh, longest answer in the world. <laughs> Have not taken a mountaineering class. Maybe will, maybe not, but there's plenty of other stuff uh, related to that that I've gone through, so. Yeah, you're making me think a lot of questions based on a lot of things you said there, but one thing I was just, you're talking about the avalanche and the rescue. And my daughter and I both have avalanche beacons. She's trained with them and I haven't, I've seen a lot of videos, 
but she was on the, it's out in Gunnison at the Western Colorado University, they call mm -hmm. it now. And it's Colorado Mountain Rescue or something like that. It's associated with the university. And they cover the whole Gunnison Valley. And that's one of the things they work on is, is avalanche rescue. And, you know, I mean, a lot of rescuing hunters that are lost, a lot of ATV rollovers even. They're going out and helping things they want on Monarch Pass when the mm -hmm. snow hits. But we were talking about the avalanche rescue, and she basically said, because they also train with the rescue, the fire department in Crested Butte. And she said, if you're not there and see it happen, the chances of rescue versus recovery, and I don't want to get morbid, but I mean, you really have to be on the spot and be directly involved in that rescue immediately yeah. versus waiting for a rescue team to arrive. Yep, definitely. And it's extremely difficult digging through that snow. Extremely difficult. I mean, your, your shovel's, you know, yay big because it's got to be in your backpack. Um, and when that snow piles up, it, it feels like you're shoveling concrete. You know, we'll go out. I, I tend to train with uh, Colorado Mountain Club, I think it is. Uh, Colorado Mountain School, CMS. They're based out of Estes Park, right by Rocky Mountain National Park. So I'll go up there in the winter with those guys and go out. And basically, it's kind of a combination of ski touring, backcountry skiing. And then in the middle there, they do some avalanche rescue, like refresher work. And they'll basically, you know, everybody turn around and then they'll pitch the, the beacon out there and bury it somewhere in the snow field. And then you've got your transponder that you need to locate that thing. Finding it's half the battle. It's not like you get an arrow that just points directly at it, right? Those things, the signal comes out in arcs, so you're kind of like walking in an arc, and then there's the depth to account for as well. So it takes some work to find it, and the clock's ticking the whole time, right? I mean, someone's under that snow for more than 10 or 15 minutes, that's probably it. So you got to hustle, and then once you find that beacon, then you got to start digging that snow out. And if they had the bad luck to get under 10, 15 feet of snow, that can take a half hour just to move that snow, right? Debris, too. Yeah, yes. debris, rocks. Yeah, I mean, most people, if, if they get caught in a slide, I should check myself. I, I believe most people, the injuries result from colliding with things like trees or boulders, getting pushed into something, um, as opposed to just getting buried under the snow. Uh, it's a horrible situ mm -hmm. situation either way, obviously. But yeah, it's um, it's really important. And they're perishable skills too, right? You know, I used to do, scu I didn't used to do scuba diving. I was scuba certified and it's the same sort of deal. You know, I did that back where I used to live in Illinois and it's not like you live next to the ocean. So actually going scuba diving all the time really wasn't something I ever did. The skills that I learned there, I probably remember none of it at this point, right? I'd be very dangerous to go out scuba diving with. Likewise, mm -hmm. someone who maybe did avalanche training five years ago and still has their beacon shot probe you know i would think twice about going out with them because you know my life literally depends on them remembering what they learned five years ago and being fit enough to execute everything they were trained on and god forbid that i actually have to use those skills on one of my friends that's why i go every year or every couple years to get that refresher myself go through that um, i don't want to forget how to do it you know if i do see one of my friends get pulled under i want to be able to locate them and dig them out and all that stuff so i try not to preach at people but i mean i won't go out with anyone in the winter who doesn't have that training period and if they don't have the equipment, no way, no way. Well, what about the, I've seen some videos of it too, where they've got the, whatever it is that blows up and yeah. it helps them keep them above the surface. I saw an actual video of somebody in an avalanche and they stayed on the surface. Yeah. Now there wasn't a debris field. It was just a bunch of snow, but still, do you use that technology or? I do. Yeah. You're just, you know, you're stacking the odds in your favor. That's all you can do. So if that helps, and I, I believe it does help, I forget what the theory is. It's like the biggest nut in the can of nuts or something. If you shake them, the biggest nut kind of rises to the top somehow. Same logic with having that big, huge uh, balloon strapped onto your backpack when you pull the trigger on it. And it's supposed to keep you floating up in that. Again, if you're not taken out by smashing into a tree or thrown off a cliff, hopefully that will keep you above the snow and you won't get buried in there. So yeah, I, I carry that. Again, if there's something I can do to increase the odds just a little bit, it's all about controlling what you can control, right? And if, if that's something that helps, then sure, why not invest in it? The amount of money you hemorrhage on backcountry skiing anyway, just on all the equipment and stuff, you know, what's another grand for an avalanche backpack? And it's your life literally depends on it. Why not? You might want it when it actually, you're yeah. in the avalanche. The thing that kills me, and I'm guilty of this too, is you don't want to be that guy or girl who ends up in the news that they recovered from an avalanche um, and like didn't pull the trigger on their bag because it wasn't charged up. Or the bags have straps that go around your legs too, because you know, you're going to be rocking and rolling when you're being carried. You don't want the bag get ripped right off your back. A lot of people, myself included, it's a pain in the ass to strap that stuff up and hike with it, you know, skin up with it. So I'll be, I'm as guilty as anyone of just being lazy and not, at least 
before I start skiing down, buckle in, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, ah, what's going to happen? And I've caught myself and there, you know, same with a helmet too. I see a lot of people skiing with a helmet and I don't care. Do you, you know, you do you, as long as I don't have to carry your ass out. <laughs> you know, there was one time when we were skiing down the side of a mountain and I, it's a big, kind of a big, big deal, right? So you've got these skins on your skis that help you shimmy up the mountain, keep you from sliding backwards. You get to the top, you got to rip those off. You're transitioning at the top. You're putting different gear on, putting your helmet on, taking off certain layers. It gets to the point where you're just like, oh, this is a hassle. I'm hurrying through this. Check, check, check. I did everything. Or my boots locked up. You know, I'm good to go. And then you get through that. I'm like, ah, oh, crap. I forgot to put my helmet on. I'm just like, ah, oh, it's not that far. This isn't that steep. I'll just go. And I started to go, I'm like, you know, this is the dumbest thing in the world. What if something happens? What if? So I put my helmet on. I kid you not, I skied down that thing, hit a patch of ice and went ass over tea kettle so hard, I nearly cracked that helmet in half. Wow. Yeah, I injured my shoulder actually. I ended up for a year and a half progressively being unable to lift my arm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. how hard I hit. Had I not had that helmet on, oh, yeah. I'd have been a ghost. There's so much to it. And again, you know, you can do all that stuff right and something can still go wrong that's totally out of your control. So right. you do need to control what you can control. You know, yep. <laughs> if there's equipment that can help, buy it. You know, be very serious about it. That would be my advice to anyone new to Colorado or, or even new to just going outdoors. Be very, very serious about mm -hmm. this, right? The 14ers are not a walk through the forest preserve, yeah. you know, even Beerstadt or, or the easy ones, right? People get killed on those. So yeah. pay attention, take it seriously, prepare yourself, make sure you're physically fit, make sure your equipment's in good shape and get out there and enjoy it. Just be aware of, you know, the risks mm. that are involved. So I was going up a small 14er and it was a Legault mountain trail up by Aspen Park, mm -hmm. not a 14er. I just like to think it was. And it had snowed and it was icy trail, beautiful, beautiful day up there. And I had my boots, some good boots and pants and you know, the clothing was okay. But I didn't have any of these ice trekkers and I didn't have the trekking poles. So coming back down, it was more difficult in my opinion than going up. Yeah. I fell twice. I had met a group of more mature hikers and probably 10 to 15 of them. And they were in a club or something, they were going up and everyone had ice trekkers and trekking poles. And I was like, man, I just fell twice. And they're like, Sonny, you'll figure it out someday. <laughs> and after that, I went and I got the trekking poles and the ice trekkers. And I was also this, you know, I carry this first aid kits and different things, the emergency sleeping bags. But what do you think is, and you were just touching on it a little bit there, what do you think is the most important thing or things to take with you when you're going up a 14 or because I'm going to add this one thing that my kids and my wife have the same opinion of and I, and I keep telling them I think they're really off. They don't want to take trekking poles so they think it's an old person thing. And every time I've been up anything and I've been up to the Sp the West Spanish Peak, I actually didn't make it. It was so steep and I wasn't in shape for it. Everybody that was climbing that because it was real, it's a, a heavy rock field. I don't know if you've been up there. Mm -mm. But they, everybody had trekking poles. And I keep telling my family, when you're going up in these 14ers, you know, they can save your knees, especially coming down. And you've got two more points of stability. Well, so what are your thoughts as far as gear for people who are thinking about taking even an easy 14er? I guess I would stand by, what is it, the 10 essentials. I mean, that's definitely probably the answer to give. Uh, what I personally take up a 14er is I take a small first aid kit, you know, some aspirin, some bandages, really not much more than that, some gauze and adhesive tape. If anything more serious than that happens, I do carry that in reach and I'd probably just be tapping on the SOS button, you know, if I broke a leg or, or was immobilized or had a big cut or something that I couldn't deal with. So a small, small first aid kit, I always, even in the summer, will bring like a puffy coat, hat, and gloves, mainly just because if I get caught out there and something does happen, you know, if you read a lot of the search and rescue reports, even people who ping those guys, you know, at, at four or five o'clock while the sun's still up, it takes them time to mobilize, takes them time to get up there. And uh, if conditions aren't good for them, they're not necessarily going to risk their lives to go get you. So I think it's prudent and wise to plan for uh, potentially staying the night up there and staying the night above tree line, right? So that, that would be cold, miserable, potentially wet. So you should do what you can to 
to make sure you can get through that. I bring a lot of food, more food than I'll ever eat. For me, I've never, I've been very fortunate. I've never had any sort of altitude sickness or anything. Even when we moved out here, I, I didn't stop running or anything. It never really bothered me. What has bothered me on 14ers is just not eating enough, not wanting to stop, not drinking, not eating, particularly eating though. Um, just again, you know, not wanting to hassle with taking my little backpack off, even though it's the world's tiniest little backpack, two straps, it's off. You just get in that mentality. You're grinding that hike. You don't want to stop. Go, go, go. And then I'll get up there. And once I do get above like 13,000 feet, I start to feel queasy and sick. And oh, you know, is this, act do I actually have altitude sickness? Is this it? No, it's just because I didn't eat. Right. So I learned my lesson. Finally, I carry a lot of calories with me and just try to munch along the way. If you're looking to lose weight, you know, lose weight during the week. Don't do it when you're up there. <laughs> yeah, It's not a diet hike, so treat your body good. Fuel it up and get to it. I don't personally carry poles. That's a, that's a personal decision. I have tripped. I still have scars actually here. <laughs> I have tripped as careful as I've been and I have learned lessons. Don't step on top of a rock that you can step around, right? That's like such an easy thing, but it took me a long time to learn that because those darn rocks up there are so uh, unstable half the time. You step on something that looks like a big fat boulder and then it just moves right out from under you. Nonetheless, again, going back to stuff happens, you know, I've tripped and slid and gouged myself up pretty good. I've got scars here and on my arms. So carry the little first aid kit, but the poles for me, I want to have my hands free because if I do slide, I do want to be able to grab something um, because I have slid in pretty precarious precarious spots up towards the top where really, you know, taking the fall, an actual fall, like if I tripped and went, it would have been a really bad situation. You know, there would have been probably a hundred or 200 foot tumble involved. I do agree. And I see the logic with having poles for the more, the hike part of it. And I guess you could always just stash them when you get up there, right? And kind of keep, keep your hands free. But no, personally, I don't carry poles. And again, I, I don't really have a religious stance about it. That's just me. So what else? Food, some good clothing, first aid kit. I don't carry a bladder of water. I carry like an algae bottle of water. And if I know I'm going to be out there for a long time, I'll carry a water filter so that I can filter some water out of creeks if there's creeks, but just bringing enough water. And again, everybody's different. I don't think you need a massive amount of water. Again, everybody's different, right? That's just been my experience. So like a big Nalgene bottle of water tends to get me through most anything, at least most anything that I've hiked so far. I try to think what else. I bring some carabiners. I actually bring a length of rope. I bring about 50 feet of rope. Again, just it's only a little bit more weight. And what if I need it, right? What if something happens? What if something happens to somebody else and I can throw them a rope, right? And maybe help them out. Stuff like that. I get it. I used to do a lot of backpacking and I understand the, the desire to keep the weight down as much as possible. But at the end of the day, again, you know, you've got the rest of the week, maybe just eat a few less meals and, and go for an extra walk or something. You know, taking a couple of pounds off your ass is just as good as leaving it out of your backpack. And if it's gear that you might need that you should be carrying, it's stupid to leave it at home just because of that two pounds. So that's, that's my uh, approach on it. Mentioned gloves. In my first aid kit, there's other stuff, right? So I have a lighter. I have means to make a fire carry the in-reach communicator. Phones, I, in my experience, on top of most 14ers, the phones actually work. They don't work getting up there, but once you're up top, they tend to work. So carry my phone. A lot of times I will haul a tripod and a big Canon 5D up there too. Big, huge SLR with a big lens on it just to take pictures. I'll get up to the top and just spam a bunch of pictures and then go home and stitch them all together in Photoshop. I have huge like four foot by eight foot pictures hanging on my walls at home of just massive vistas taken from the tops of 14ers. They're, they're beautiful and it's not like you can just, you know, jaunt up there any day of the week. So mm -hmm. it's worth capturing those views and I try to take advantage of that. My wife fell not too long ago. We had tennis shoes, I mean, just street shoes. Yeah. We went to REI and I bought some Solomon uh, hiking shoes. Mm -hmm. And these are boots, all Solomon boots. But yep. she got some, I don't remember what they were, but we both got trail shoes. And since then, you, I mean, the trails that we go on a lot down from your Larkspur area, they're not real steep, but they're still that fine gravel. Right. And ever since we got the right shoes, we have not slipped once. And I can tell from the bottom of your shoes that that looks a lot like what I have with my Solomons. And yeah. Are those Solomons or what are... Uh, these are Sauconies, actually. Okay. Uh, so I've kind of changed my stance on that. I used to always wear, like, heavy hiking boots. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, I think Solomon GTX-4s or something mm -hmm. was kind of my, my boot of choice. They are heavy, and, and I know I just said it's easier to take pounds off of you than worry about what's on your feet. I, I just changed my opinion. I used to kind of like the ankle stability that having, um, like, high-top boots provided. Mm -hmm. I just decided to start wearing 
trail runners and I, I wear a pair of Solomon uh, speed cross, which are like trail running shoes. They, they have much more grip than even these like big mm -hmm. knobs on them for running pretty technical trails. And I've been doing 14ers in those and I've actually enjoyed it quite a bit. And I don't miss the ankle support of actual hiking boots. And I certainly don't miss the weight of hiking boots. Plus if they get wet, they dry out real quick, right? Cause it's just real, it's running mm -hmm. shoe fabric. I've also found ironically to me, like you mentioned, coming down those things is, is the pain, right? And I would agree with that. I feel like I'm hitting the brakes every, every step I take down. It's like you're slamming on the brakes, slamming on the brakes. And it just, over the course of whatever, six, seven miles, it really starts to impact your knees, especially when you've got old knees. So having actual just trail runners on, believe it or not, once I get down to a more runnable section, I will try to just kind of lightly jog my way back yeah. down, just kind of keep light on my feet so that I'm not constantly slamming my feet into the ground with every step. And I've noticed that really, I feel a lot better once I mm -hmm. get down. I used to get down and just immediately drop three aspirin and then, you know, go look for a hot tub somewhere. You know, I'm not Superman like anybody else. Uh, my knees hurt if I pound on them all day long. So yeah, I've kind of gone the, the trail running shoe bit as well. We'll see how long that lasts. Well, I was telling my wife recently and the way I explain it to her, and as long as you're not in a real technical area, it's almost, I, I, it's like the, the Pirates of the Caribbean, what's his, Johnny Depp. Yeah, he's always drunk. I just, because she's always so tense and she's putting on the brakes so hard that she's causing herself to slip. There's this friction issue, you know, yeah. that you, you learn in, in college and engineering and all. And so I just tell her, it's like, relax, act drunk, act like Johnny Depp and just kind of be a little bit more loose as long as there's not a bunch of rocks and just, you don't have to run fast. Just let yourself go a little faster. Yeah. No, that's good advice. So I just trail run exclusively. I don't run on concrete again because of the knee factor and I don't like the pounding. What you said, if you look at like pro level trail runners, uh, especially out here in Colorado, their advice is basically like run drunk down the mountain, like flop your arms out, look as goofy as you can, uh, whatever lets you keep your balance, but keep moving at a good pace. That's what they do. So yeah, they look like idiots charging down a mountain, but I mean, these guys, you know, they're running like Pike's Peak. So, yeah. so they're obviously, they know what they're doing, but yeah, that's real good advice. If you get stiff, you know, you're all rigid, I guess you're, you're probably more prone to trip or mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Yep. Yeah. What have you seen? Cause I know you're out a lot and have you seen any, you know, without getting into private information on, cause some things with medical things, you're not supposed to share things, but have you seen things that you've been a part of or seen as far as either rescue operations or falls or injuries when you've been out? I've been pretty fortunate. I've never, I've never really had anything serious happen to myself. I've had to pull the plug early on a, on a couple of backpacking trips, mainly again, because I was eating incorrectly and ended up making myself sick. That's about the worst that's ever happened to me. Now, backcountry skiing, I've gone out with people who've just had the misfortune of like clipping a stump that was buried under the snow and taking a full speed header coming down the mountain, compound fraction, fracture in the arm, calling the SAR, waiting for someone to get up and help carry them out, which again goes back to making sure everyone's geared up. You know, we, we were able to stabilize that person and, and wait for help to arrive. So you just gotta let, you can't probably reset that unless like maybe you're a doctor, you might. Uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe But do you're, it's gonna be sticking out and you're gonna point. wrap it or something. Yeah, and the person's going into shock. It was a bad situation. Know. I've never seen someone take a fall. I've never actually seen I've never seen like what you would consider a big avalanche. I've been out there, I've heard the whoomph of the snowpack settling beneath you and I've seen avalanches around me happen, but never anything close enough where I was like, holy crap, we gotta get out of here or anything like that. But again, I'm very cautious. And uh, especially when I used to backpack more, a lot of those trips on YouTube, I used to go out alone a lot. So I've got the inReach, you know, which is some, some level of lifeline in, in case something goes wrong, but you're out on your own. So just again, being aware of the risks, understanding the area you're going into, trying to make a lot of good decisions every step of the way. And really when that becomes challenging, I think in any outdoor activity is when you're tired, right? Coming down a 14 or you're tired, you, you start to look for shortcuts. I don't want to step around that rock. I'm just going to go over it and then it slips and now I have a scar on my ankle, right? Stupid stuff like that. Downfall, the trees especially the trees. You know, I used to just try to not stop running and like hop over the tree <laughs> that's laying over the trail, which inevitably has all these pokey bits sticking off of it, right? And you're just waiting to catch your foot and like run one of those through your thigh seven miles from nowhere. So again, just 
being extremely conservative. I am not risk adverse. Obviously, I do extremely risky things, but just managing that risk as best as you possibly can. You know, I think that's the approach to take. But yeah, I don't really have any horror stories to share. Fortunately, I'm happy to not have any horror stories to share. That's about the worst of it, that skiing accident. And like I said, I've knocked myself around pretty good. I had that weird arm thing. That happened right before the pandemic too, right before they locked everything down. So as I couldn't go see a doctor, I could like, over time, I could no longer lift my arm at all. And then it just sucked. It was like a year and a half of PT and stuff and frozen shoulder syndrome. Is what That's they because it. you didn't get the PT, right? I don't know. They said, you know, even my PT, it got to the point where I'm like, you know, I just feel like it's all jammed up. Can't you just like, just rip it? Like just the rotator cuff? Arm. Yeah, something up in your shoulder. Okay. You know, ironically, that's how we used to deal with this. We would just, one person would hold the guy, the other person would yank that thing back and just free that joint up. But there's a high chance it's going to like really seriously injure you. So we don't do yeah. that anymore. You just go through PT forever and eventually it gets better. And eventually it did. I don't know if I even years later still have full mobility yeah. as far as raising this over my head, but it's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I saw an orthopedic surgeon. He's like, PT will get you through it. Unfortunately, the shoulder is just like God's poorest work. It's a horrible joint. It's everything is just kind of floating in there and held together by good luck. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take much to really jack that up. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. the that's the worst that's happened to me. So you mentioned several times that you have an inreach. What kind of inreach is it? I have a very old inreach, uh, Delorme. Before Garmin bought them, a Delorme, okay. uh, I want to say an Explorer, InReach Explorer. It's big. It's bigger than a phone. Really? Yeah. So the new thing. Garmin Explorer, which is not new anymore, probably a lot smaller. Because it's, it's probably, it's like the 66i and the 67i. It's six inches or so with the antenna maybe. And I should have brought it out of my truck, actually. I carry it in my truck because I, I keep the subscription active. Because mm -hmm. obviously in Colorado, there's a lot of places where your cell phone doesn't work, although yeah. that's changing. So I would keep it just in case I was stuck in the boonies with a flat tire or yeah. something bad happened to my truck, at least I could get, get a message out to my wife. But it's big and it's thick and relatively heavy and it's got a horrible interface on it with a screen that you can maneuver through to try to send a text. Obviously, even when I bought it, there was a phone app, that EarthMate app, where you could type on, on your phone and, and work it that way. But it's been great. I've had it, gosh, probably 11 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. It still works. The, there's been no problem with the battery or anything like that. So I don't really see any reason to get rid of it. That said, they just changed up all their plans. I was paying you know, close to 30 bucks a month for forever to keep that thing on. I think the new plan's like be $7 a month or something, but I have to pay per text. So it doesn't cost me anything if I'm in an emergency, mm -hmm. but if I wanted to text back and forth with you or with my wife, if I'm mm -hmm. out, I have to pay for that. Yeah, I have an un unlimited messaging, so I could text you all day. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> God, some money. But the cool thing, you know, we were talking about this earlier, is now with the iPhone, the latest software update, you can text through your iPhone even if you don't have cell signal. So yeah. as long as it has... I guess, uh, line of sight to a satellite, mm. which is pretty much the same as an inReach. You can text back and forth right off the phone. So at that point, you know, I don't know, do I want to keep giving inReach or Garmin anything? You know, yeah. why pay them anything at all? If I don't know what I would be losing by giving up the inReach. I have a Garmin watch, which I wear all the time. So if I actually wanted to track my route, yeah, I've got the Phoenix 7. Mm -hmm. It's great for route tracking and stuff like that. And obviously keeping all the other stats, uh, collecting all the stats. So between that and the phone, kind of seems like everything's covered at this point. I I don't know. I don't know. I guess mm. I'll have to give it some thought. It never well, has. It never hurts to have two of something either, right? Right. So, I think it's gonna be interesting watching the technology race here. I know Starlink's really pushing the boundaries. iPhone is also, and I think Garmin's got a and others have to ACR, Zolio, all those. They're gonna have to get on board, and maybe there's that niche of extreme outdoor stuff and you want that real rugged device and you don't want to have it synced with your phone my guess is behind the scenes they're probably working on something that's going to combine technology we'll see i think in the next a year to two years we're going to see some major changes because if yeah. garmin were to keep going as they currently are well they'll probably be out of business before long yeah I've got mine, I don't know if you do it with yours or if you can, but I sync it with my any, any one of my devices, the 67i Mini 2 Messenger, so I can activate the SOS on my watch. Oh, I didn't know that. And I don't know if you can do it with your older device, but yeah, you can, there's this process you go through and I've actually got a video, you know, if anybody's watching, check it out in the description below, but it's actually fairly easy to set up, but you have to go through a few steps that just don't make sense. I had to call Garmin to make sure it was set up correct. Mm. That's one thing to be up on the technology, whether it's a phone or your watch or. <laughs> it's funny what you were just talking about. I was thinking that that would be the, the killer feature for Garmin to come up with would be, you know, Apple, I think on their, on their watch has some sort of fall detection. I, I mean, this watch tracks like everything. 
it should be able to track if like you lose consciousness based on your vitals, right? And if it can talk to your inReach, that seems like a no-brainer. Like the guy just took a header and he's knocked out. Let me talk to the inReach and get the SOS out, right? Mm -hmm. That seems like that would be a really good feature. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. The rate of technological change has certainly been increasing. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. I will say the inReach battery life smokes the phone. I mean, mm -hmm. even the phone's really good now. Uh, you know, it used to be cold weather would kill them almost instantly. My phone will last a couple of days if I'm prudent with how I use it in the backcountry. But that inReach, I mean, I've gone out for six, seven days and that battery has come nowhere near to dying, so. Yeah, that's why I always talk to people about is if you're gonna go out on a day hike, that's one thing. If you're gonna go out for a week, then you better be able to charge your phone, right. any satellite communicator. They typically will last a lot longer, but even then it'd be nice to be able to charge those up. But if you want to go out and you take a device out and it's dependent on that being synced with your phone and your yeah. phone's going to die, you've got to be really careful of that. Yeah, which again, I think, you know, going back to kind of the two is one, one is none factor. I can see kind of keeping the inReach, even though the phone seems to have some of the same functionality now, as far as its ability to communicate. A phone battery can die, you could drop your phone. I mean, they're fairly fragile. That inReach, I've, I've dropped that inReach off cliffs and that, <laughs> that thing just will not break. So yeah. yeah, probably good, especially with a piece of equipment like that, where it is your, your lifeline to search and rescue or ride for life, God mm -hmm. forbid, flight for life. Probably smart to have back up there and I, again i don't it's not to sell something but if you do have a watch or like a an adventure watch like you and i have i would take the time to and, and especially especially if you have the the adventure watch with a satellite communicator if it can sync because of a big fall or say you walk over somewhere and you put your pack down yeah well if you're separated from your pack or somehow it's jarred and it but you know the i use a backpack tether if that busts and comes off, but I'm still within reach of the signal and I can hit this SOS here. You can even actually send pre-recorded, not pre-recorded messages, but some quick text messages you'll be able to send from the watch. Hmm. It's really worth looking yeah, into. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I've always uh, kind of gone back and forth on where to stow the inReach, right? Either have it on a mm -hmm. lanyard or a carabiner or keep it in my pack. Because mm -hmm. uh, like you say, what if you lose your pack? Or You know, the, the general line of thinking is you don't want things external to the pack because they can get mm -hmm. ripped off, especially if you fall. So I don't know. I go back and forth. I just throw it in my pack. Honestly, if I lose my pack, I'm pretty well um, up a creek anyway. My car keys are in there. <laughs> yep. If anyone ever finds my pack. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yep. somebody was asking me a week or two ago and they said they were going snowboarding in Japan and they had a 67i and they were asking you know because they saw I had the backpack tether and they're like well is that secure is it good and I said well yeah but if you're jumping out of a helicopter on top of a mountain and you've got this you know velcro strap with this cord in an aggressive you know rough situation I wouldn't want to test it so my advice to them was put it inside your jacket when you're going hard down the mountain yeah and then when you're walking or doing something within reason then you can put it out put it on top so yeah. because it's the tracking too you want people to see where you're at but you know you're going to go down that mountain so fast you know depending on how fast you're tracking two minutes ten minutes whatever it is i wouldn't want to lose it yeah, so I, I don't know if they were on a resort. If they're carrying an inReach, I assume maybe they were doing some backcountry boarding. You know, hopefully they had gone through the avalanche training. One of the things they teach you there is that beacon, that avalanche beacon, you know, it either needs to be strapped to you. You know, they've got that big harness thing that will hold it on you, not in your pack, not in your coat, things that can get ripped off. Or it needs to be in like your pants pocket. And typically there is some sort of connector in your pocket that will latch onto that and keep mm -hmm. it in there. Again, because if that thing gets ripped off, it's useless, right? Someone will go locate your beacon 100 yards away from where you are what's right. the point of that yeah any any sort of emergency device i would think keeping it probably <laughs> now that i say this keeping it on your body would probably make a whole heck of a lot of sense so maybe i should start sticking the inReach in my pocket yeah yeah you got pants are zipped up or something yeah something yep. so you've got um 14 years you're gonna go hike i'm curious about what 14 years you're going to do and i think you've actually mentioned it earlier here but what are the things over the next several years that you've got planned to do some big outdoor adventures is, is everest in the picture ever no probably nothing that grand i'm not a big planner my plans tend to be relatively near term so like i was telling you once Colorado monsoon season wraps up, which is typically 
worst case, maybe end of September. I try to, you know, I guess a small goal would be every weekend in October, get out there and, and climb up a 14 or hike up a 14 or next weekend, we'll probably head out towards Buena Vista area. I've still not totally decided, but thinking maybe do Mount Missouri. Princeton's right there too, is right? Yeah, Princeton's actually where I got that scar. Okay, uh, so Missouri is right next to it? Uh, they're kind of all in a line there between like Salida all the way up to Leadville, the whole, okay. uh, it's the Swatch range. And then within that, there's the collegiate peaks. So things with names like Princeton, Yale, Oxford. There's a group of them there, Oxford, Belford, and Missouri, which on a long day with good legs, you can do all three. I'm very tempted to try that just from uh, ego, notch on the belt you know, can I do it sort of thing. Then again, I don't know if I want to have that long a day. So might just do Missouri this trip and maybe try to tag team uh, Oxford and Belford on another weekend. But yeah, so there's those three that I haven't done. There's also uh, Harvard remains and then Albert and I believe Holy Cross way up there. I think those are the ones that I have left in that Pacific range. So I had a pie in the sky dream of getting all those done this year. I don't think that's going to happen. I had some personal stuff chew up some weekends, but yeah. I enjoy it. I don't mind driving back and forth out to Buena Vista. It's a beautiful area. Uh, so if I can get out there every weekend this coming month and do a bunch of them, that, that'll be fine with me. Longer term, um, just staying healthy, trying to stay fit. Again, you know, I take a very, I don't want to call it manic, but I'm very serious about my fitness. It becomes very challenging to maintain your fitness over time, especially as you get older. Recovery is a big issue. The wear and tear from running six days a week does add up. Again, I am not Superman. I'm built no differently than anybody else. So eventually there comes a point where I have to dial that down or I will get injured and then I can't do anything, right? I don't want to get injured. So coming up very soon, this will probably be like my last 40, 45 mile week running. And then I'll start killing off some of those days that I have legs that are ready to do 14ers after that ski season is going to arrive. So I want to maintain my cardiovascular fitness so that I can skin up the mountains and ski back down them. But the weather's also going to turn, so I'm not going to be able to run as much just from that perspective. Again, because I just avoid running on streets. So there's kind of that natural ebb and flow with the seasons. So my longer term goal is just to continue to stay fit as I can to support the things I like to do. I never really have given myself goals of an Everest. I don't particularly care if I do all the 14ers or not. I just want to keep getting out there and enjoying nature. That's that's really it for as long as I can. That's my goal. So I don't understand something though. I think a 14er looks great from about 10, 11,000 feet, maybe even sitting in a hot tub. Yeah. <laughs> And I've been up to some 12s and, well, and I, I've been up to Pikes Peak, but that I drove. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful, but I would, no joke, I mean, I'd rather sit here, especially in the fall with these aspens starting to turn and be looking from low to high. It's just me personally. Sure. And But you, you seem to really love the challenge and the, the beauty from being up high. Yeah, yeah. I like this too. Um, don't get me wrong, but yeah, I, I definitely like getting out there and it doesn't have to be some monster mountain either. I mean, some of the stuff just around us here, these foothills are probably mm -hmm. nine, 9,500 feet and they're rugged and there's probably no trails up there, right? So that's, that's a whole different challenge, just navigating your way up to the top. I'm not uh, an altitude snob or anything like that. If, if it gets me outdoors and I'm enjoying what I'm doing, then I'm happy to be doing it. I feel blessed that we have that opportunity, especially in this state. Yeah. Yep. No, it's great being here. So do you want to tell anybody about your youtube channel or social uh, sure media. yeah so my youtube channel or name or whatever is wanderlust 073 don't even remember why i picked that <laughs> it's been up there for a long time don't have a lot of subscribers feel free to smash that subscribe button if you if you visit but yeah it's just like i was saying it's it's basically just kind of a collection of things that i've gone out and done so a lot of backpacking videos skiing videos uh there's some fishing on there fly fishing got some uh short videos of my dog when she was a, a puppy puppy she's still pretty young but just some funny videos of her but yeah i've always just kind of viewed it as my digital scrapbook right, right. it's a great place to look back on and i still even now i'll look back on stuff i did whatever six seven years ago oh, that was so cool you know and with my friends just look at those trips so but yeah feel free to check it out always happy to uh, if you're interested in going to any of those places feel free to leave a comment i try to reply to the comments i get and uh, always happy to share what limited advice i can offer as to the you know how to get there what to do when you're there or whatever well thanks for coming and hanging out with me today yeah thanks for chatting with me it's been fun all right we'll see you around and we'll have to hook up and all right i'm not sure i'm going to do 14 or with you though that's all right well, i'm going to go fishing so maybe you can get into that <laughs> all right thanks eric you bet